They should be the most innocent members of society. But children can be capable of the most horrific, premeditated and violent murders. I thought they are so sadistic what they do to my son. Evil, just pure evil. What drives these children to kill strangers, their family, even their closest friends? I have completely blocked him out of my life. I've pretended like he has died along with Ellie. With access to police officers and their evidence. Charging a 16-year-old with, with, with murder is heartbreaking um, because, because they are children, they are kids. And the insight of a leading criminologist. When you render your victim less human, it's much easier for you to be able to attack and kill them. We ask if they're victims of their environment, or are they born evil? What sort of person can do that? We hear first-time testimony from the families of innocent victims. The scumbags, through and through, and I hope they have a terrible time in jail, which they should, being child killers. As they reveal the devastating impact of losing a loved one. 20 minutes, that role it's OK, um, to go on. And, um, yeah, and she died in my arms. In the early hours of the 11th of August 2007, Lancashire Ambulance Service received an emergency call. The girl who dialed 999 was risking her life because she was witnessing her own friends beat, kick, and stamp on two innocent victims. You know, she trained them out both sides of her face. Her ears, her ears, massive. They were black and yellow and running with pus. And um, they'd obviously ripped a big chunk of her head out. The paramedics who attended couldn't actually make out the gender of both victims, particularly Sophie, because of the level of swelling, the bleeding. 20-year-old Sophie Lancaster and her boyfriend, Rob Maltby, were walking home from a night out when they were set upon by a gang of teenagers. Even if you despise somebody, how can you do that to somebody, you know? You, you just, you just can't comprehend it. Sophie and Rob were targeted because they were goths. When people feel that the other group is less important than they are, that gives them permission psychologically to do harm to that other group. Sophie was on life support for 13 days, but succumbed to her injuries and died on the 24th of August. They turn the machines off and they do the best they can for you, you know, they try and make sure that everything's quiet and, and whatever else, and they turn the machines off. Two teenage boys, Ryan Herbert and Brendan Harris, were convicted of her murder. There was no real reason why they were attacked in that park other than possibly being a bit different from the group. This hate crime sent shockwaves around the world. I don't think you'll ever be happy with whatever sentence they get. You know, is it a life for life? I think so. Sophie Lancaster was born and grew up in the Rossendale Valley, near the town of Bacup, north of Manchester. I was Sophie was um, always quite a complex baby. She was quite a complex little girl. She um, always, she liked to spend time on her own, even when she was a baby, actually, when I look back on it now. And, um, and then she became quite clingy at one stage, as they all do. She was a combination of, you know, one day she'd be really quite chirpy and out there, and then the next day she'd be really quite quiet and quite introverted, really. And even as she was growing up, you know, going to primary school, she was still the same. And um, really strong-willed, actually. It was clear from an early age that Sophie was very independent. 
She didn't have many friends at school, um, I have to be honest, because I think the difference with Sophie was she was she was intelligent and um, she didn't seem to suffer fools gladly, let's put it that way. She was quiet when she was at school and she certainly was not a sporty child, let me put it that way. Um, she'd sit just and read a book and she enjoyed her own space, actually. Sophie's individuality really came to the fore after spending a summer with a friend. Yeah, it started when she was about 12. She'd gone to a friend's house for the school holidays and refused to come home. So she stayed there for six weeks. And, um, yeah, and I remember her, you know, coming home. And I'm stood washing up and, and she came in the back way. And I looked at her and I thought, oh, my Lord, look at this. She dyed her hair and she came in, you know, looking quite, quite cool, really. And I looked at her and I thought, wow, that's amazing. She's be obviously becoming to be who she should be. All teenagers want to belong. They want to have a place within the world. And they're a bit like sponges. They soak up things that they think are important to them and they look out for like-minded people that they can also join with. It gives them a sense of social identity. The largest town in the Rossendale Valley, just a few miles from where Sophie grew up, is Baycup. Baycup is a beautiful place. It's surrounded by the most amazing hills, countryside, lovely walks. The town centre has been described as one of the best preserved town centres by the English heritage because the buildings are just stunning and they're also totally unique. But the former cotton mill town also struggled with an undercurrent of intolerance and violent behaviour. Antisocial behaviour was a big issue back in those days. Um, it would be top of the agenda for people complaining about problems happening, not just in the town centre, but out in the park as well. The remnants would be seen the day after with the empty bottles and the cans and the litter strewn everywhere. As a local journalist, you would see the same names cropping up time after time. Two names that would regularly appear were 15-year-olds Ryan Herbert and Brendan Harris. Ryan Herbert was very well known to the police. Um, he'd, he was known for antisocial behaviour and some low-level criminality. Brendan Harris, um, very similar. Herbert was known as... A Police described him as a local menace. Um, I knew that he'd have been in trouble before, and he was involved in, in um, antisocial behaviour. And from friends, I knew that as a as a child in in primary and in secondary school, he was a bit of a troublemaker, and he would be a bully. He'd pick on younger kids, kids who didn't have siblings, so no one to stand up for them. Harris lived with his mom and his brother. Um, I've subsequently been told that he would be taken to the pub with his mom and brother, young and older brother, and when from quite a young age at the local youth clubs, I know he certainly was uh, quite aggressive, quite, he could get into fights. By August 2007, police were aware of three separate incidents of battery, actual bodily harm, and threatening behaviour by Herbert. The most recent of these assaults also included Harris. Four months before the attack, both Herbert and Harris had been involved in an incident when a boy was chased and kicked and stamped on. And that attack was in the early hours of the morning and it was only stopped because the lad's mum intervened. Herbert and Harris were arrested and convicted for the attack and were placed under the supervision of the youth offending team. That was why they were before the youth court and that was why they were subject to youth referral orders. So they had history. It was against this backdrop of youth offending and violence in Baker that Sophie Lancaster was making new friends. I first met Sophie in 2001. We were in an amateur dramatics play together um, and then we didn't see each other for a few years until we all joined the same friendship group when we were teenagers. We'd both evolved in our appearance and, you know, our personalities were starting to show. And in our small area in the Rosendale Valley, it's not a huge place. So anybody that's a little bit alternative, we all came together. It's tribal. Everybody 
you want to be part of a tribe, don't you? It's a natural thing, everybody clans together, and when you are outwardly as alternative as we were, it's, it's natural and it's safety in numbers. This is all about how we establish our identity, our social identity. We tend to seek out those people that we think have similar t tastes in clothing, similar tastes in music, similar tastes in culture, similar tastes in sport. We seek those people out and we see that that, that group of people as forming our culture and that culture becomes stronger and stronger. But in Bacon, standing out from the crowd, carried risks. We were outside a takeaway and these lads came over and I had a, a headband on and sang happy birthday because my friends thought that that was funny. And this lad came right over into my face and he was flicking it, flicking it and flicking it. Um, what do you look like, you know, things like that. So I said, you know, clear off, you know, we're just waiting for a takeaway and he told me to shut up and I didn't, I, you know, I said just leave us. So he punched me a few times, black eye, bus lip, cheek out there. So Sophie and her friends would find places to congregate away from troublemakers. It sounds cliched but there was a, a graveyard that we, we used to hang out at and, and we were safe up there because people don't really tend to hang out in play, you know, in, in graveyards and we never did anything wrong. We just we just sat there and played music and chatted. And Sophie found love when she met Rob Maltby. It was like two souls had found each other when they met. She just relaxed. She'd found she'd found her love. She'd found somebody that loved her and and she loved and yeah the the two souls I think they'd known each other before and they just re met again. By now Sophie was also considering her future. Her love of reading led her to decide to study English at a further education college. Oh, she was looking forward to it, yeah. And that was nice to see, because at one stage, you know, she would have been quite, oh, a bit scared of that. You know, new things, new people. But no, it was nice to see that actually she was up for it and she was ready to embrace it, actually. So that was good, that was good. After completing her A-levels, Sophie decided to move in with Rob. Started to live together in Bacup, not far from here. Um, I think she would then have been 18, 19. I think, yeah, I think so. And, and then they moved in a small flat together. But on the 11th of August, 2007, the couple's hopes, dreams and lives would be shattered, leaving Sophie's mum to face a tragic decision. I think by the end of it, we were asking them to turn the machines off. Please turn them off. She would have hated this. In 2007, 20-year-old Sophie Lancaster had moved in with her boyfriend, Rob, in the Lancashire town of Baycup. They were inseparable. They stayed together and they seemed quite happy together. And, um, you know, they'd come to me every weekend and they were quite chirpy together, so... I think they had arguments. And I think our Sophie, in fairness, wore the pants in that relationship, let's put it that way. By the summer of 2007, Sophie was on a gap year planning to start a degree in English, a subject she was deeply passionate about. I don't think people quite understand <laughs> When I say she read a lot, she read a lot. And um, and one day, you know, she's walking down the road and walks into a lamppost and gives herself a black eye, because she's reading. And she's walking down the road. Uh, seriously, that was her... That was just who she was, that's just what she did. And she just spent a lot of time reading. On a fateful Friday night, the couple were socialising with friends. So fr on Friday the 10th of August, Sophie and Robert had gone to a friend's house just on the outskirts of Bacup. So they'd, they'd recently moved into a flat in Bacup town centre. They went to a friend's house uh, drinking. They, they weren't particularly drunk, but they'd had a few drinks and left sometime after 11 o'clock. It was roughly a two mile walk back home to their flat in Bacup town centre. On the way back, they passed a 24 hour garage where they stopped to buy some cigarettes 
and they encountered um, some young girls there who were really intrigued and interested in certainly Sophie's look because she was very striking looking with her gothic appearance and her piercings and such. If you saw them, you would call them goths. There's no two ways about that. And yet they would never lab label themselves as goths. They were always individuals. The girls convinced Sophie and Rob to join them for a drink in nearby Stubby Lee Park. Stubby Lee Park is beautiful. It is an amazing place, but it was symptomatic of the issues that the town centre was having. And, of course, it was a good place to congregate in the park. You were away from public view to a degree. It was quiet. You could get up to whatever you wanted to. Nobody really disturbed you. On this warm summer night, there were dozens of other teenagers in the park, including Ryan Herbert, Brendan Harris, and a large group of their friends. They had consumed an awful lot of alcohol, um, and they'd also had sex in the park, so they were fueled up and testosterone, and apparently a Herbert on alcohol was not a good mix, from what I've been told. He became a totally different person. Sophie and Rob stayed clear of the gang of teenagers. There's a bit of a uniform to people who live in Bake-Up sometimes. At that time, it was very much what we would label as chav. I know that sounds horrible. Um, but it was tracky bottoms, it was trainers, it was, it was track suits. I live in a multicultural city. I live in an environment where I'm going to encounter people of different colours, people of different faiths, people of different sexualities. It's one of the joys of living in a multicultural society that we'll meet people who are not like ourselves. However, if you live in a monoculture where everybody has the same colour of skin, where everybody has the same sporting interests or musical interests, that kind of monoculture can experience difference in ways which are more dramatic than when we would encounter difference in a multicultural society. And that's what I think is also underlying what happens to Sophie and her boyfriend of the time, that they live in a monocultural society that does not have the infrastructure and history of being able to cope with diversity and difference. Unfortunately, when Sophie and Rob walked into the park, they soon attracted the attention of Herbert, Harris and the rest of the group. A lot of witnesses talk about it being a really good atmosphere, a really friendly atmosphere, people genuinely being intrigued by Sophie and Rob's appearance. But then things turned sinister when the group of the, a member of the group stepped forward, probably being goaded by another group member, and started to punch Rob. A gang of boys led by Ryan Herbert attacked Sophie's boyfriend. He was beaten and kicked to the floor. The only way you can explain the level of violence is to understand that there was a, an audience to this violence. If there are lots of people viewing the violence, that tends to encourage more violence than you would see if an audience wasn't present. In other words, if you kick once, somebody will shout, do it again. It will escalate very quickly because the norms of the group permit more violence to be used than is necessary in terms of subduing the victim, of attacking the victim. The gang stopped kicking Rob and retreated, leaving Sophie trying to help him. And it's a strange one, that, you know, cos you think, oh, my God, you know, how brave, how brave was she? But why the hell didn't she run? And um, even to this day, you know, I often think about that. Why didn't she run? because the gang returned. Sophie didn't see them sprinting back towards her, and she was unaware as one of them jumped into the air and drop-kicked her in the back. The beating she would now receive from Herbert and Harris was unimaginable. The other context is othering. The violence that you see in this is because 
the group that attacks Sophie and her boyfriend have othered them. They are seen, in other words, by the group that's doing the attacking as being less than, less than human than the group who's attacking. And therefore, that gives them permission to continue the attack in ways that absolves them of any responsibility for the violence that they are using. The individuals involved used extreme violence, um, and anybody who witnessed that, one would have been traumatized, I think, and frightened, and secondly, probably very frightened about saying anything against those individuals for fear of reprisals. But as the attack continued, one member of the gang found the courage to get help and dialed 999. Don't down for me. That attack is still happening and a girl is on the phone giving details to the ambulance service. She is also in jeopardy because she's got a phone to her ear and those kids know she's doing something and they are still attacking Sophie and Rob. And you can hear that attack in the background of that call. By the time the ambulance arrived, the attackers had fled. Paramedics were appalled by what they found. The paramedics who attended couldn't actually make out what the gender of both victims, particularly Sophie, because of the level of swelling, the bleeding. Rob and Sophie were barely alive and were rushed to hospital. The next morning, unaware of events, Sophie's mum went shopping. Only when she got home did she find out something terrible had happened. You know, you open that front door, that's when your whole life changes. And you can never go back. You can't step back into your old life, that's it. You know, you're moving forward, really, into a life that you don't particularly want. It's the reality, you know? You'd rather give anything not to be in this other world. That's what it feels like. You know, because as I walk in through the door, there's a card on the floor, and I pick it up. Please ring Burnley Police Station Urgent. In the early hours of Saturday the 11th of August 2007, Sophie Lancaster and her boyfriend Rob were attacked and savagely beaten in a park in the town of Bakeup, Lancashire. They were rushed to hospital, where Sophie's mum was shocked to see the extent of the brutal attack. You walk in, oh, it's horrible. And you look, and you think, how could somebody do that to a human being and leave them and think that that's OK? And I don't know who were crying most, actually, me, your dad, your brother, the nurse was crying. And, um, you know, she trained her marks both sides of her face. Her ears, her ears were massive. They were black and yellow and running with pus. And um, they'd obviously ripped a big chunk of her head out. And she had a long neck, and it's black, and it's crinkly and shiny like a bin bag. And the only other marks on that girl's body, up both arms and up both legs, and one on her back, the one on her back is where they booted her across the tarmac, and she'd obviously tried to defend herself. But everything was on her face, everything on her face, on her head. And I've never seen anybody who's been beaten up. It was shocking, really, really, really shocking. Initial assessments suggested that Sophie's injuries were not life-threatening. I was Sophie had cat scans done on her brain, there were no fractures, no breakages. And so the first day they said, oh, she'll be fine, you know, come back tomorrow and um, we'll take her off the life support and she'll be fine. You think, oh, okay. You go back the day after, you know. And I'm just walking in, actually, as they're taking her off the life support. And um, they have her sat up and she's spewing up and she's going, no, no. And she's making movements with her hands like that. And it's funny, you know, I don't, I'm not very medical, medically inclined at all. But I do remember watching and thinking, God, that's not right. It's not right. 
As medics worked to stabilize Sophie, detectives ramped up their investigation. On the first Saturday, we probably spoke to in excess of 30 young people, some of which had been within the, that location at the time, some of which hadn't. But from that, we could build up a network of associations of individuals who um, were friends with other individuals. And as a result of that, we got quite a, um, a, a significant list of individuals who could have been at that scene. And then we started with a meticulous um, inquiry of actually visiting all those to see what they knew. Despite quickly identifying many of those in the park that night, detectives were faced with a wall of silence. What we did encounter, though, is that a lot of people were very frightened of speaking out about what had happened because they didn't want the same thing to happen to them, bearing in mind that this was an extremely violent uh, event. But people were talking to the editor of the local newspaper. I went out into Bake Up and it was... People knew about it and people were already telling me names of people involved. But everything, people were very cagey and they were wary, but it was the talk of the town. When you're trying to investigate a case, any case, but especially a case involving young people, and especially in investigating a case where you've got to interview a group of young people, what you've got to do is establish rapport with people within that group. And by establishing rapport, I mean that the police have got to convince members of that group that they, the police, can be trusted. Information can be given to them. But some of the witnesses in the park that night eventually found the courage to speak to detectives. Police made five arrests, including the apparent ringleaders, Ryan Herbert and Brendan Harris. Well, initially, the five suspects that were identified as a result of speaking to witnesses um, uh, were initially arrested for grievous bodily harm. They were all charged with uh, grievous bodily harm um, on both Sophie and Robert Maltby. The five boys were released on bail awaiting trial. But in hospital, while her boyfriend's condition was improving, Sophie was not responding to treatment. Your emotions, it's like a roller coaster. And the doctors are keeping you informed every step of the way, you know, you know what's going on. And um, it must have been probably the fourth or the fifth day. And they got us in and um, she's brain damaged. OK. And so they have her sat up in bed. And she, it's funny, you know, her little dreads and she, but her eyes were tracking side to side, and there's nothing there, nothing at all. Sylvia decided to share her daughter's plight with the world. Right from, really, after she'd been attacked, more information was coming out about what happened, and then Sylvia released a picture of her in hospital, and that picture of her in hospital just, you know, it just speaks for itself what kind of ordeal she went through. But yeah, the, the details that just kept coming out, even if you despise somebody, how can you do that to somebody? You know? You, you just, you just can't comprehend it. Realising that Sophie might never recover from her injuries, detectives made an unusual decision. Uh, and this might sound really insensitive, but we couldn't really wait for Sophie to die, to have a post-mortem, because by that time, some of those external injuries may well healed. So it's quite a tricky decision, um, but a decision that we reached with the agreement of the family, who were very supportive. I did take the unusual step to have a home office forensic pathologist examine Sophie while she was still alive in hospital. And this was unusual, because clearly, a home office forensic pathologist um, deal with deceased individuals. But whilst medical staff are very good and are experts at saying what the injury is, a home office forensic pathologist can tell us, from an expert point of view, how an injury has been caused. The pathologist made a critical discovery. One of the key pieces of evidence that the home office forensic pathologist gave is that the level of force on both sides of the heads was such that it could only have been caused with simultaneous kicking. So as a result of that, it was almost impossible for one person to cause those injuries. So if you were to think of it like a football, two people kicking a football at the same time, and the injuries caused um, were quite significant. Had it just been one person, 
the head or the football actually, would have flown to one side and then the impact would have been less. So the evidence that the home office pathologist gave was that actually the injuries were so significant on both sides that it must have been braced by equal or similar force on the other side. And that was really compelling evidence when proving that actually there was more than one person involved. Detectives could now prove that at least two or more people contributed to Sophie's injuries. That evidence became vital when the case changed from one of assault to murder. I think by the end of it, we were asking them to turn the machines off. Please turn them off. She would have hated this. And what happened was, she blew up. It was, it was all very odd. She blew up. And, and became quite fat, really. Um, and you could see then that it's obviously not right, isn't any of this? What the hell's going on with her? And it turns out that her, her body um, was just giving up, you know, she was going into organ failure and, and whatever else. Why would you want to live like that? You know, you can't eat, you can't drink, oh, no. And then they decided to send her down for brain stem cell tests and say to me, don't come in. And, um, and they took her down for that and I can see the nurse coming back with her on her stretch and the nurse was crying. And you know, there's no hope for her. Sylvia called as many of Sophie's friends as she could and told them to come to the hospital. No, you're not allowed to touch her. Um, you, you can't touch her at all. I didn't speak to her at all, till we were going. But we all we were all just sat there talking about happier times, you know, just or remember when, you know. Remember when this happened or did you know that? But yeah, I didn't speak to her till the end and that was just to say goodbye. Cause you know, there's nothing else you can say. They turn the machines off. And they do the best they can for you, you know, they try and make sure that everything's quiet and, and whatever else, and they turn the machines off. A joint decision. Um, there was no point in keeping those machines on. No point whatsoever. And, um, yeah, they turn them off. 20 minutes, that were all it took her um, to go. And, um, yeah. And she died in my arms. Thirteen days after the attack, Sophie Lancaster died. The police had interviewed over 100 individuals while Sophie was still alive, and many had been reluctant to talk. Her death changed everything. I suppose it intensified our efforts, really, because uh, when it became apparent that this now, you know, young lady lost her life, you know, quite needlessly, it certainly changed the dynamics, I think, of the investigation and everybody involved in it. There was many young witnesses who were very reluctant. Some of them, um, I wouldn't say they changed their attitude straight away, but I think, uh, thankfully, they got influenced by some of their family members who realised that actually this wasn't just an assault that they could weather the storm and ignore um, and, you know, sort of not assist with. This now was a young lady who died. It had national and even international attention from media, certainly from the golf community. And I think that influenced many family members to then put pressure, for want of a better term, on some of their young family members who'd witnessed it to come forward and give us evidence. I often say that when you're investigating cases like this, it's like shaking a tree. Initially, when you shake the tree right at the start, Nothing falls down from the tree. No branches fall, no leaves fall, no fruit falls. But the longer time goes on, the more you shake the tree, the more things begin to fall from the tree because there's an understanding that those old group loyalties aren't as fixed and as firm as you have first imagined. The investigation into Sophie's assault now became a murder inquiry. It allowed the police to re-arrest the five boys, including Herbert and Harris. While they were in custody, their homes were searched. In terms of Ryan Herbert, we did significant forensic analysis of everyone's clothing. But we were fortunate to have Sophie's blood um, on the, his shoes and on his lower um, parts of his jeans, which was uh, consistent with him either 
stamping in a pool of her blood, or as our case theory was, um, kicking her and her blood splashing onto his shoes and to her low garments. So that was really compelling forensic evidence against Ryan Herbert. Detectives would need more evidence, though, if they were to gain other convictions for this brutal murder. I don't think you'll ever be happy with whatever sentence they get. You know, is it a life for life? I think so. On the 24th of August, 2007, Sophie Lancaster's mother agreed with doctors to switch off her life support following a vicious assault. She was very peaceful. And it's a right strange thing. This is going to sound mad. It's a right strange thing. And you've got that body. And you know she's there. And you know she's there. And you can see it that she's there. And then the next minute, she's not. It, it's really strange. It's as though... I'm not religious, but it's as though something just leaves and, and you just have that body, that empty shell, and that's the reality of it. Very odd. Five teenagers, the youngest of them just 15, were charged with her murder. Witnesses had told police that 15-year-old Ryan Herbert had led the attack, and under pressure, he soon admitted his involvement. Whilst he was on remand, he rang his mother and he had a conversation with his mother, which was recorded, and we went through the right procedure to produce that as evidence. And his mother uh, implored him to tell the truth and say that if, had he not attacked her, then he should tell the police that. And he replied to something to the effect that, actually, well, I did, didn't I? I did kick her, like everybody else, and I am guilty. 15-year-old Brendan Harris was also charged, but the case against him was not as strong until police hatched a plan. When they were remanded in custody, we chose to um, place a covert listening device in a police vehicle in the back of a van where they were being transported uh, into custody. And they did have a conversation about um, kicking her head like a football. Uh, so that was quite compelling evidence. Now, police had the evidence they needed to convict Brendan Harris, as well as Ryan Herbert. At Preston Crown Court on the 14th of December, 2007, Herbert, Harris, and three others pleaded not guilty to both the murder of Sophie Lancaster and the charge of GBH of her boyfriend, Rob Maltby. They would return in March for their trial. Even though we didn't have direct evidence of the three others attacking Sophie Lancaster, we charged them um, on the case of joint enterprise. The law of joint enterprise can be used against a gang in an attack when police are unable to prove which one of them delivered the fatal blows. When their trial began in March 2008, all five admitted assault. But then, out of the blue, Ryan Herbert pleaded guilty to Sophie's murder. When Ryan Herbert pleaded guilty on the first day of the trial, ironically, that diluted our case of joint enterprise and the defense for the other three defendants were very keen to say, no, this is two incidents. In the end, three of the boys were only convicted of GBH against Sophie's boyfriend. But Brendan Harris was also found guilty of Sophie's murder, thanks mainly to the evidence from the Home Office pathologist. Herbert pleaded guilty to the murder, so Brendan Harris tried to say that it was all him. Well, what, what nailed him was the fact that the pathologist said it's impossible for one person to have caused those injuries. In sentencing Herbert and Harris in April, the judge described the attack as feral thuggery and suggested that at least wild animals, when they hunt in packs, have a legitimate reason for so doing, to obtain food. You have none, and your behaviour on that night degrades humanity itself. What shocked me more than anything was when it came to, when it came to the sentencing, and seeing them staring at the judge out while he was delivering his ten-page document. I was <laughs> amazed, because anybody else would have been in fear of their life. Herbert and Harris were sentenced to life imprisonment but the minimum terms were raised because the judge recognised that the killing was a hate crime. I don't think you'll ever be happy with whatever sentence they get. You know, is it a life for life? I think so. But I'm also very grateful to the judge. He used the hate crime legislation, section 146, and that enabled him to enhance the sentences, which is what he did. Ryan Herbert was sentenced to 16 years and three months, while Brendan Harris received 18 years. The only motive established for their crime was one of hate. Sophie Lancaster was murdered just for being different. 
There was no real reason why they were attacked in that park. So it's just senseless, and I think you throw into the mix then really, really young people involved in terms of witnesses, but particularly the offenders. I just think it's a really sad state of affairs and a sad reflection of society when that sort of thing happens. Thankfully, it is very rare. I honestly don't know whether they were born, whether they were made. You know, obviously you've got the nature-nurture debate going on there. And I do think about it a lot, but I can't. I can't come to a conclusion, I can't come to a decision what I think, and I suppose in one sense, that's a good thing. Why would I want to be able to get into their mindset is reality. We find ways of describing our enemies which make them less than human, which therefore gives us permission to behave towards them in ways which we would not normally engage in. That othering is an essential part of seeing our enemy as less than human and therefore being able to kill them. So it's about choices at the end of the day and um, you know, uh, Brendan Harris and Ryan Herbert that night had a choice, a choice to walk away, intervene and stop it or behave in a far better way and they didn't. And so in some respects, some may say they're young, should he have sympathy? Well, you know, I know a lot of people in my life who would never behave um, like that when they were that age. Since Sophie's death, her mother has dedicated her life to making the world a better place. You think about things, obviously, because it, unfortunately, it gives you a platform to work from. Now, you can either go with where your heart is, or you can stuff it all and just sit on couch and fetch. Now, to me, I always wanted to be in schools talking to young people. I decided, with in my wisdom, you know, when I look back now, I think you must have been bonkers, you. Um, I'm going to start a charity up, you know, no way about it. We'll use our Sophie's name. She won't mind. Well, she was never meant to die at that stage of game, so that's OK. So we came, my friend actually came up with a strap line and it's stamp out prejudice, hatred and intolerance everywhere. In 2013, Greater Manchester Police became the first to monitor and record hate crimes and incidents against people from alternative subcultures. Many other forces have followed suit. Police forces have adapted the hate crime legislation and the world is different. Nobody is the same with the same likes and interests. So why, why be afraid of difference? There's nothing scary about it. The only scary thing is that you don't know and you don't understand, but you know, get to know different people, get to find out a bit about them because there's a hell of a lot more in common that you have with people than different. In 2014, Sylvia was awarded an OBE. A credit to her mum, you know, to have that, that foresight and that strength and that drive and determination, you know, to not just sit in a corner and be, you know, crumble at what's happened, to have that strength and you know, all the communities come together, all of the, the alternative communities, and it, it's all it's all one. It's such a strong, such a strong movement. And 13 years later, you, you know, we're still, we still know who she is, but she's still changing the world. You know, it's, it's some fate. Sylvia Lancaster continues to forge a legacy for her daughter. Oh, I've no intentions of stopping, actually. No, I will carry on until I drop dead, really. And um, as long as I can keep getting that message out there and people will listen, that's where I'll be.